I'm Ed Shaughnessy. I'm going to keep drumming till I get it right. <laughs> you never get it right, so I'm going to keep drumming. Here's Eddie Shaughnessy and Buddy Rich. To, to share some of your incredible career and your incredible musicianship and the incredible history that you are in music education. Okay. So if you would, let's start from the beginning as far as, you know, drums and how you got started and where to Well, it's like a lot of kids. Uh, my first association with any kind of music was in high school. The voice said to me, where are you going with that snare drum, young man? And this was the voice of George de Vivier, who later became one of the most eminent New York bassists. Uh, he used to be called the Ray Brown of the East Coast. I think he was the George de Vivier of the East Coast, but he was a sensational bass player, and he was 10 years older than me. And he said, you want to play? I said, yes, sir. Come on in here. And they had a trio that was called, and that called, King called trio, bass, guitar, and piano, but no drums. Now picture this, these guys, these three black guys take a kid like me, just because he's got a snare drum, they get him a stool, I set up my snare drum, and I played with them, and of course they lied and said I sounded fine, and they said, you can come here two nights a week, we do Friday and Saturday, and I did that for quite a long time. Now, I don't think you could do that today, you know, if you go to the Blue Notes, you have to have $150 to hit a band. <laughs> it's a different era, but... Uh, I was very fortunate because I didn't have a lot of connections or anything like that. I just had what all these gentlemen have, a passion for music and a passion for drumming. And uh, that was the way I sort of got started in New York. And through George and a few other people like that, I started meeting people and networking. Now, the only thing I can say is if you don't have a really terrific passion for practicing and getting better, uh, go into aluminum siding or something else, okay? <laughs> because unless you're willing to give it 110, 120 uh, percent, it won't happen for you because there are a lot of people out there really working hard at it. If you have that, then keep plugging along. I, again, I don't want to sound like gloom and doom, but that's the reality of it. An older guy in Jersey said to me one time, an older bass player, the cream will always rise to the top. And he said, even though you don't know anybody in New York, you're starting to get to know a few people and get a few little jobs. But he said, the main thing is keep working and keep practicing and get better. And I found everything that he said was absolutely true, that you've got to keep plugging. Don't get discouraged. We always have those discouraging things. I, for instance, was told I had a scholarship at Juilliard for uh, Jersey, New Jersey people. And when I got out of high school, I went up to Juilliard during the summer, and I said, hi, I'm Ed Shaughnessy from William L. Dickinson High School in Jersey City. I have a scholarship here. And the nice lady said, you used to have a scholarship here. We canceled New Jersey last year. <laughs> and I remember walking out of uh, Juilliard, you know, with a couple of tears in my face because I knew I couldn't afford to go to music school, and I thought, oh, this is a really bad day, dark day. Well, 10 years later, I did a clinic at Juilliard. And I was really knocked out that I was there trying to help other people at Juilliard. Whereas when I was 16, I thought it was the end of the world that I couldn't go to Juilliard. So I mean, look how things turn around, you know? Uh, anytime that I take a breath and you have a question, please, the only, <laughs> only question that's bad is the one you don't ask, because a lot of people are shy about asking questions. I don't know everything, I know quite a bit from just being an old duffer. But, uh, and what, let, let me go back to you. Yeah. 16 lessons that you took, teachers you had. And I only had one teacher. Who was that? Bill West. Bill. There, were, there were two very good teachers during the 40s in, in New York. 
Uh, one was Bill West and the other was Henry Adler. Mm -hmm. Famous name, right? And uh, I got lucky. I met a, a wonderful drummer named Willie Sharp who was going in the Navy. We were in a music store together, never met him before. I was buying sticks or something. And he struck up a conversation and he said, do you have a good teacher? I said, no, nah, there's nobody in Jersey where I live that is any good or knows anything. And he said, well, I'm going to go in the Navy. I'm going to ask Bill West to give you my spot on Saturday because Bill was in the Merchant Marine and he could only teach about six guys on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Here again, the kindness of a stranger is yeah. it's amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And so I became uh, the new student uh, at the age of 14 with uh, Bill West. And he was teaching where? Huh? He was teaching where? Where was he teaching? Oh, he was teaching up above a dance hall on Broadway and uh, 47th Street. There was a dance hall, Diamond Dance, you absolutely, know? Absolutely. Oh, man, I thought it was great because yeah. the chicks from the dance hall would come up to the studio, and once in a while they'd do splits and things, you know, for a, a hot 16-year-old. This was the highlight. It was, it was much more important than the drum lesson at the time. Oh, man. Ed, is that, is that place still there? I want to go down there. <laughs> it was great. It was just... It, you can imagine, this country pumpkin from Jersey, I didn't know squat about anything. I mean, I was raised Irish Catholic and terribly guilty about everything. And um, this was great. I mean, I felt like I was getting into the, the real world, you know. I mean, and, then, seriously. and then playing in New York, when you started to begin to play in New York, and, and uh, you mentioned Henry Adler, yeah. who, who was an incredible you know, teacher and player and had oh, yeah. a good shop. And taught. Yes. And, and did you eventually then get involved with teaching? I did. In fact, I rented a studio um, just a few years, and that's not at 16, but I mean, once I had a little bit of a reputation uh, in my early 20s or so, I was trying to stay off the road at the time. I had a pretty good reputation in the jazz world, but I didn't have much of a reputation in New York yet. You know, it takes a while to, to get that New York rep, right. whereas you can be... I'll give you an example. When somebody like... Um, Steve Gadd was playing with Chick Corea. Everybody knows Steve Gadd with Chick Corea. But I bet even when he first went to New York and tried to stay off the road, it took a little while for him to network, Absolutely. as much admired as he was. Yeah. You know, that type Absolutely. of thing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I rented the studio uh, over Henry Adler's drum store and started to teach there. There, there are many students uh, that have studied with you that are still around actively playing. It's amazing your oh, reach yeah. and what you influence. Well, I'll around. be frank. Uh, I just love teaching. I never had to teach to pay my rent, and I don't mean that in any kind of a subjective way. I always worked. I was lucky. I always worked. But I always, even when I was doing The Tonight Show five nights a week and doing quite a few record dates, you know what I say? If you go out, I've gone out with Doc Severinsen and we've played to five, ten thousand people, you know. I mean, that's nothing compared to rock arenas, but for a big band, big jazz band, that's a big crowd for us, 10,000 people. And I've gotten many a standing ovation playing my drum feature, okay. But the next night, you have to go out and bust your butt the same way to get this, don't you? But when you teach, I like to say there's a long tie on the note of teaching, and I get Christmas cards and I get emails from students that I've taught 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and we still, our friends and we still have that great relationship. A guy just sent me an email and said, I bet you won't believe I finally got that five stroke roll that you said I could never get. <laughs> I mean, he was kidding, of course, he was a fine drummer. But uh, I'm just a guy that, if I don't do any, t even at my age now, I always teach somewhat out here in California. Yeah. You know, I don't carry a lot of students, but it's, it's, there's a different reward to teaching, yeah. and if you don't like to teach, you shouldn't teach. And if you're a grumpy teacher, you shouldn't teach. Right. But if you like to help people, and you get a kick out of seeing somebody go up and get better, there's nothing like it. You know? it's, it's different than this. And I like this. I'm as much of a ham as anybody. I like this. But when it's over, it's over, right? But not with teaching. It's not over. It just goes on forever, you know? Well, I have beautifully said it. Beautifully yeah. said it. Very, very I mean, that's the honest yeah. about too. Very well said. Now, here you are. Here you are at that time in New York City. When did the, you started playing with a variety of musicians? How did the Tonight Show come about where all of a sudden you got that, that gig down? And who were you playing well, with? Well, actually, I'd like to, if you don't mind me saying so, my first big break, you know how uh, Dave Weckl got well known with Chick Corea? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Brian Blade gets even better known with Wayne Shorter yeah. than maybe before you. Know? Yeah. Well, my break like that was Charlie Ventura, a terrific saxophone player. Tenor player, yeah, yeah. And uh, I used to go around to 52nd Street, which was a legendary place with about eight jazz clubs in the space of two blocks, if you can imagine. 
And you could buy a Coke for about 50 cents at the time and learn how to nurse that Coke and hear great players like Max Roach or Art Blakey or Sidney Catlett or any of the great guys. I know I'm talking names that are very old to you guys, but these are the style setters of my era in the 40s. But then when the group broke up and I wanted to come back to New York, uh, again, it took a while to get established. Yeah. But I will answer your question. A lot of people ask me about The Tonight Show. I played on that show for 30 years, if you can picture that. In my infinite wisdom, I came home to my wife and said, they asked me to join The Tonight Show band. She says, what do you think? I said, well, I'll tell you. This guy, Johnny Carson, is pretty good. I mean, he's hot. I bet you he lasts four or five years. <laughs> and he lasted 30. <laughs> that was my infinite wisdom at the time. But what happens on a job like that, unlike, you know, when some really big rock band is changing drummers or getting a new drummer. I mean, I've read this story so many times. I'm sure you have, too. 200 guys will be auditioned sometimes. I mean, sometimes. Sometimes it's 10. Sometimes it's 20 or 40. Well, in the world of The Tonight Show, there is no audition. You, I know this sounds a little self-serving, but you have to have so many qualifications that they already know about. You follow what I mean? So I, at the time, was Ed Shaughnessy. Uh, well, how old was I? About 30. I'd already done well over 100 recordings. I'd played all kinds of shows. I could sight read up a storm. Uh, I was sober. I was on time. And most guys liked the way I played. Yeah. Therefore, I was on a short list of hiring for The Tonight Show. That's the difference. There's no audition involved with that. But you always, you always swung your tail off. You always played music at such a deep level. And always, always, your integrity on the instrument has never changed. Thank you. I hope not. I think it's very important. I used to always know, every night that I played on The Tonight Show, I knew a lot of young drummers were watching. And I mean, seriously, I always wanted to play very good first for myself and certainly for the band, but I always wanted to, I hope, give an example of a first-class drummer. I just did NAM on Saturday. Well, I had at least 20 or 30 guys who said, you know, I'm playing drums because of you. It yeah. makes you feel good. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it really does. Well, it, it, make just... that a, an extra one, because it was myself, too. We'd watch that show religiously. Oh, yeah. And the opening part of that show, when you played, you always had, you know, phenomenal fills. You always had that the different sized bass drums that was always unique in a setup at that time, which was way ahead of its time to mix match sized bass drums like that. You always had creativity in your setup, you always played great, and you always smiled and looked like you were having the best time. Well, I was having the best time, yeah. that's the truth. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I never forget an old lady who was, must have been 80 something, came up to me after a concert with Doc's band and she said, you know, Ed, you're so happy when you play, you make me happy all for two hours. And I thought, what a fun thing that is, that I made her feel good because she thought I felt good playing the drums. I oh, mean, cool. Yeah, that's kind of cool, especially if it's sincere. It's not, yeah. it's not forced yeah, or anything. Yeah. But anyway, that's the way it is on certain jobs in certain areas. It's not an audition. Uh, I would say at the time I got hired, there were maybe two other drummers in New York at that. Now, let's, that might sound a little out there. It's not. You know why? Most of the drummers who could play big band jazz couldn't play rock very well. I'd gone into my studio five years before that, and I worked with every James Brown, Sly Stone. Those are the records that I particularly liked, but I mean, I worked to become a good rock and roll drummer. I wasn't one when I started. I was a good jazz drummer, and I was a good big band drummer, but I wasn't a good rock drummer because I hadn't had a chance to play any rock. Quite frankly, I turned myself into a good rock drummer. Not a great rock drummer, but I could play professionally and play well, and I pleased all the rock and roll acts that came on the show. But I admit to you freely, I wasn't one of those guys just rolled out of bed and said, hey, I could play it all. No, my background was in jazz and big band. But I could see the handwriting on the wall. The guys in New York whose work fell off, Tom, mm. some of them were very stubborn. Yeah. They didn't want to play rock and they roll. They didn't want to go into that, yeah. And as a result, I mean, they really had to go do something else because... That was the handwriting on the wall. But you embraced it because you know? imagine on that, that I kind of a show. It actually, it was a challenge. You know? it, but you accepted the challenge, which a lot of people don't do. And you accepted <laughs> that challenge. But the amount of variety of talent that was on that show in week after week that you had to play for. And, and yeah, I had a chance to play with Jimi Hendrix, of all people, when his drummer Mitch got sick. That was wow. a real treat, really. How cool does that mean, you know? Somebody <laughs> just sent me the tape. I finally heard it. Really? Yeah, it's great. It's not a DVD, but it, 
it's a audio tape, and yeah. yeah, it was great. How cool is that? So, w what memories do you have as far as artists on that show that uh, that you really enjoyed, or, or that stuck out to you, or that really opened up your mind musically, or challenged you? Uh, some of my favorite people were people like BB King, um, because he would rehearse with the same fervor that he did when he gave the performance. He mm. didn't know how to do rehearsals. He only knew how to do, do BB. Yeah, 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 I love BB because yeah. of that. Ray Charles was a constant problem. Uh, he sent many a drummer to the rubber room. Uh, I mean, really, he drove many drummers wacky. He got on my case, then he got everybody else's case. What, he was, was, his, a problem. what was his thing? What, 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 what was he requesting? Well, Ray, I mean, even Paul Kreibich, who was a fine California drummer, spent four years with him. I mean, I, I, it's hard to describe. He would just, he would perform the song on the show at about two-thirds of the tempo that you had rehearsed it. Mm. And when you started, because you had, I had a good memory for tempo, so it was my business, you know? So when you wanted to get into playing it at the rehearsal tempo, he would turn around during the show and say, that's not right. Mm. But I mean, that was the way it was, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. And finally, Doc, uh, he yelled at Doc one night, and we never played for Ray Charles again. He had to bring his own band. Uh -huh. He was the only act in 30 years that Doc said to the producer, we don't play for him no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, that's the truth. I, I admire Ray Charles as a great artist, don't get me wrong, but he could really get on your case. He was a, he was a tough guy to work with. He really was. BB was great. All the great singers, uh, Tony Bennett. And we had even Pavarotti, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, so many wonderful people, and everybody had great respect for our band. Well, when, when they came in, how, how was rehearsal? They came in with charts, they came in with a book, they yeah. handed it out. You showed up at 3 o'clock, rehearsal started at 3.15. Mm -hmm. Usually a guy would come with a roller and brand new arrangements and pass them out. I want to emphasize, I don't think anybody here would be dumb enough to not think of being a good reader, but this is a case of you've got to be a very good reader because you've never seen the charts before. You're just seeing them then. Right. And uh, that's the secret of that kind of work. And recording is the same. You know, everybody doesn't have a garage band where you take eight hours for each tune. Sometimes you go in and you have to do four tunes in three hours, right? I'm sure Absolutely. you've done that. Absolutely. I've done that. Absolutely. So good reading... You know, good reading put me ahead of my actual ability on the drums. I could read very well by the time I was 16. I said 18 on that thing, but I was really a good reader by 16. So that when you're not maybe the very best player yet, mm. the fact that you can read so well, a lot of guys hire you because they know you can take care of business with mm. the paper. You know yeah. what I mean, don't but you? But you also swung, too. You, you read well, oh, yeah. and you well, made it feel good. Sure. But anyway, you showed up. Uh, you, I want to answer your question accurately, and uh, Doc was supposed to get the rehearsal done in one hour. Well, sometimes we'd have arrangements with a lot of mistakes and things, you know. Yeah. Uh, new arrangements just written, you could yeah. smell the ink, it was yeah. really. <laughs> and uh, sometimes he would have to ask for an extra 20 minutes or half an hour. But in television, uh, television, everything, the clock is the boss. Everything is by the clock. That's why being late, Doc only fired one guy in 30 years. And he was uh, a really good bass player. And he came late once, and the crap hit the fan because the director of the show comes to Doc and says, why don't we have a bass, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like one trumpet out of four being gone. There's only one bass player, there's only one drummer, there's only one pianist, right? And uh, this guy was late twice, and Doc said, I'm sorry, pal, but if you're late again, it's the end of the road. And he was late a third time. And he lost out on about 15 years of a really great job. I'm just trying to emphasize there are some gigs where being on time is essential. Yeah. Television is one of those. I was always early. I like to tweak the drums, you know. I'm one of those tweaky drummers. <laughs> Do that stuff, you know. And um, anyway, so you rehearse for an hour, and uh, you play all, maybe four or five new pieces of music that you haven't seen before for a singer. Sometimes it's a dancer, sometimes it's a magician, yeah. of all things, and a uh, oh, juggler. Yeah. I'm going to give you a big secret now. <laughs> oh, by the way, I have a book, only 9.95 on Kindle. I promised my late wife I would finish this book, because I started it five years ago, and then I forgot about it. And she made me promise her that I would finish it, because I know books like this seem self-serving, 
But quite frankly, the only reason I started this book was I had so many educators, Dom, and other players, you're one of them, yeah, yeah. said, Ed, you've got to put some of this stuff yeah. in the book. You once said that I to said, me. Absolutely. I'm sure you remember it, right? I, I do. I'm telling I, the I, truth. Absolutely. You've got to put some of these great stories hmm. in a book because, yeah. you know, first of all, at my age, there's not many guys my age, unfortunately, yeah. left to tell these stories, yeah. you know. So that's the reason I really did the book was the encouragement of people like you who were very kind and said you got to get it in a book. And you can download this from on Kindle. Yeah, on Kindle for nine ninety five, or the real book is a big fourteen ninety five. And I'll tell you later if anybody's interested, you just go to Rob at Rebeats dot com, and you can get the real book. Anyway, I didn't come here to hawk my book, but I came here to tell you there's some fun stories in here that I think you might very much enjoy. I really think, like the Jimmy uh, the Jimi Hendrix thing was great. He had a power pedal, and he hit it once during rehearsal, and all the lights at NBC in the entire studio went, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and so they said, to, they said to Jimmy, Jimmy, whatever you call that, he called it hit my power pedal. Don't hit that during your performance, because obviously it connects to <laughs> everything. And Jimmy was feeling pretty good by the time we did the show. He had snakeskin <laughs> pants, which I just thought were the best. And, uh, and, and he was so kind to me because, you know, I was subbing for Mitch's regular drummer, wonderful drummer, Mitch Mitchell, but he got food poisoning. And uh, he was great to me. He said, uh, just play the hell out of the drums. I heard you play with Charlie Mingus the other night at Birdland. If you can play like that with me, we're cool. Give me a lot of cymbals. I said, okay, whatever, whatever Jimmy, it's a pleasure. And during a number called Fire, I could see him from the side, and his eyes got big. And he reached his foot over to the pedal, and he hit it, and he blew all the electric out for all the cameras and the lights in the studio. I swear that's the God's honest truth. Yeah, he did. And the guy, the engineer came over and said, give me that goddamn pedal! And he took it and hit it on Jimmy, and then they hooked up another main line. This is a true story. It's the only time the show ever stopped like that in all those years. I think one other time a camera broke and, uh, and, and they rewired whatever they had to rewire and Jimmy had to go do it again, uh, you know, without the power pedal. I just loved that experience though. It was such fun because I, I saw him getting revved. I thought to myself, I bet he does it. I bet he does it. I bet he does it. <laughs> yeah! And everything went dark. It was just great. Don't forget we were taping the show. It wasn't live. So, I mean, it wasn't like people at home experienced this, right? But that was fun. It was a great thrill working with Jimmy. I mean, you know, when I've, when I've had a chance to play with everybody from Louis Armstrong through Jimi Hendrix, that's a, a pretty broad spectrum. It, it really is. You know, and for us drummers, there was nothing better than every few weeks when Buddy Rich would be on the show. Oh, yeah. And he'd walk on that show. And the classic, I, I, I have this at home, when the two of you played together, and you just tore it up. I mean, to go toe to toe with, with Buddy, my life is the honest you, truth. You, you, you held the torch on that one for sure, really, really high. Tell us a story about your relationship with Buddy, getting to know him, and then playing with him on the show. Oh yeah, I really miss him. I'll tell you, drumming is a lot more fun with him around. Well, first of all, Buddy Rich was not the uh, mean, irascible character that he's been drawn as because somebody made a tape on a bus because the band played bad. What, what nobody that I know pays attention to, an important thing, I heard that tape just once in my life, I don't want to hear it again. What you don't hear, what a lot of people don't hear is him telling the band, you're breaking my heart out there, because they played so bad. That's the only reason he went off on them. Yeah. But he was a great guy. Uh, when we lost our 18-year-old son to a reckless driver, he called me from Europe. He heard it on uh, you know, the, the BBC, the BBC yeah, yeah, that, yeah. and he said to me, Eddie, I just heard something. That's not little Jimmy that I played with in your house. He used to come to my house. My wife said, my late wife said Buddy Rich was the nicest dinner guest that ever came to our house. This was the other side of him. He would sit on the floor, play with my two boys, appreciate everything that she did, never talk about himself. He, he never would talk about himself. I mean, seriously, this is the other side of Buddy Rich that a lot of people never got a chance to see. He ran a tight ship. He could be a mean son of a, a bee. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, he could be. I've, I've seen him in action. I had plenty of arguments with him. We had plenty of toe-to-toe -to -toe yeah, yeah. if I didn't like what he did. And uh, that's why we were friends. 
Now, here's the history that you, you would love this. I'm playing at 17 in New York in a little beat-up club on 10th Avenue. I have one pair of drumsticks. I break one stick, try to tape it. It won't work. So I say to the leader, Sal from Brooklyn, <laughs> Sal, I'm really screwed. We're, we got the whole night to go, and I don't have any more. I really was that broke. I had one pair of drumsticks. He said, we're cool. I said, why are we cool? He said, my old friend from Brooklyn, Buddy Rich, is playing around the corner at the Paramount Theater. You go around and say, Sal from Brooklyn sent you, he'll give you sticks. Seriously, this, is, this sounds like a bad movie, but it's true. So I go a block and a half to the stage door, you know, pimply-faced kid from Jersey City. I said, could I see Mr. Rich? Who are you? What do you want? I said, I represent Sal. I remember saying, I represent Sal from Brooklyn. And the guy goes on the intercom, and here comes Buddy down the stairs with this beautiful blue, elegant satin robe on. I mean, look like a movie star, you know? Hey, kid, how are you? Hi, buddy, I'm Ed from Jersey City. I'm working with Sal from Brooklyn. Sal, that's my man. Hey, we started out together. You know, he gives me the greatest welcome. So what can I do for you? I said, Mr. Rich, I am so embarrassed, but I broke my one pair of drumsticks, and I'm working with Sal around the corner. Could you loan me a pair of sticks? He said, of course. He calls some guy, and he says something to him, and he talks to me. Are you going to school? I said, I just finished high school. That's good. Are you playing a few gigs? I said, yeah, I'm just getting started. I said, uh, uh, I sure enjoyed hearing you play. I had actually gone to hear him play, you know, maybe earlier that year with the Tommy Dorsey band, and I was flabbergasted because I'd seen a lot of drummers by then, but I had not seen him. And the fact that he could do stuff that, I don't mean just speed, the fact that he controlled the drum set the way he did just put me away. Control was incredible. Yeah, total control, you know, and uh, anyway. So the guy comes back that he talked to, and he's got a brown package, and he said, there's 10 pair of sticks. That'll cool you out for a while. I said, 10 pair of sticks? I mean, I was so embarrassed. He said, oh, man, I get them by the hundreds. Are you kidding? I get them by the hundreds, really. He did say that. I get them by the hundreds. I said, well, I'll never, never forget this. He said, no, no. Don't tell anyone you'll ruin my reputation. <laughs> That's a true story, I swear. So now uh, I'm 17. Now let's jump ahead maybe 10 years. And I'm going down to Birdland, a club I worked at a lot, so I just you know, walked down to hear my friend Charlie Mingus, the great bass player. And who's sitting at a front table near the door, rather, is Buddy Rich and a guy. And Buddy says, hey, Eddie, I haven't seen you. You know, I'd only seen him maybe one other time or two times, you know, for, for when I was with Charlie Ventura's band. He liked that band, so he came to hear us a few times. Anyway, so he says, uh, come on, sit down with us. So we sit down. Now, don't forget, we were not real friends up until now. We sit down, and he listens to Charlie Mingus, who was a personal friend of mine and a genius of music, as far as I'm concerned. And he says, well, what is that crap going on up there? And I go off. I said, what's the crap? Why are you here on your off night? I said, that's Charlie Mingus. He's a genius of, of composition and a genius of the bass. Where do you get off? And the guy sitting with him, who was his press agent or something, said to me, you can't talk to Buddy Rich like that. And Buddy said to the guy, take a hike. He made the guy get up and leave. And he said, let's listen a while. Now he got quiet and he listened to Charlie Mingus for a good five minutes, and then he put his hand out, and he said, you know you're right, this guy is real good. <laughs> and he said, I think we're gonna be friends from now on. And that's the way we got to become friends. That's a true story, word for word. And he liked the fact that I stuck up for my friend Charlie. He, he really, he got, and he did admit that Charlie sounded pretty good. So we became quite good friends after that. And uh, I wanna tell you what happened the night of the infamous, we called it a duet. Everybody calls it a drum battle. We'd been trying to do a, a drum battle, our duet, on The Tonight Show for about two years. And the director said, ah, oh, it takes a lot of lighting, ah, oh, it takes an extra camera, ah. Oh. So finally, I went to Johnny Carson and I said, hey, Johnny, I've never asked you for a favor. I've been on the show, you know, like, 17, I've been on the show 15 years. I never asked you for a favor. What can I do for you? I said, Johnny, you love Buddy Rich. You're great friends with Buddy Rich. You love me. Can't we do our duet? <laughs> and he said, yeah, why? Are you having trouble? And I told him, you know, the technical people think it's a big pain. And he naturally, he just put the word out, next week, Ed and Buddy are going to play. <laughs> so now, we rehearse with the band, but we don't play any solos. 
And Buddy says to me, he was the greatest when you did something like that. He said, what do you want to do? We'll do whatever you want to do. I said, well, the band will play, and then they'll stop after one chorus. And I said, you take it, play a little while, then I'll play a little while. Let's do three of those. And when I get done with my third, I'll start dun, 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 like a cue with single strokes. Right. You join me, and, and then being you're nearer the band than I am, you count to dock one, two, three, four. Bring them in. He said, that's a great routine. Well, it was simple, you know. You need something simple in those situations. So we rehearse, but we don't play one bit of solo. And we just play the cue. I play the cue, and now we're all done rehearsing. And I said, now write me out out there and do some of this crazy <laughs> stuff that's going to make me look like an idiot, <laughs> you know, and can't play. He said, would I do that to you? I said, yeah, I think so. He says, oh, don't worry about it. We'll be cool. He said, beside that. You're a great player. I like your, you know, I always say I like your playing. I said, I know. Just don't do some of that stuff. You know. I mean, he did have a lot of moves that nobody else could do. Maybe today some guys have finally tried to practice them over and over, and they think they can do them, right. but not Thank really. Right. So we get out there, and now it's time for our big thing, right? So band plays. I point to Buddy. He plays some nice stuff. Points to me, I play some nice stuff. On my second <coughs> little solo, I didn't realize it, but what I did visually from having seen it, I moved around the drums kind of fast. I had four tom, three tom toms. Oh, by the way, I went in with a single bass drum, and he said to me, oh, you got a real set of drums for a change. Because <laughs> I was a two bass drummer. But with him, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to play on a you know, regular set. Yeah, yes. Smart. So anyway, for the first time since we started, the audience applauded. That's the first applause that we got on my second break. Well, that's all it took. It was like taking the red flag in front of the bull. Oh, man, left hand under, left hand over, around the neck, around the I mean, he did stuff that, again, nobody could do. And of course, he got a terrific applause on, on his third one. This was his third. And then I, and I didn't know what the hell to do after he did all this. So instead of trying to play, I clicked the sticks and grinned at him like, hey, show me. Which was a safe move, right? After everything he did. And then I did my, uh, my cue and we took the band out. So now we're, we're all done with the show. And uh, later Johnny said he got more mail on that than anything in Absolutely. many years, really. Wow. So I go to the dressing room and I say, hey, pal. <laughs> hey, old buddy. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot for left hand under, left hand over, <laughs> around through the, up your crotch and everything else. <laughs> and he says, uh, what do you mean? I said, you said you wouldn't pull any of that stuff that I can't do, nobody else can do. I said, whatever happened to what you said? He says, you know what? I got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah. That's true, a true story, right? That's a true story, yeah. Anyway, we have, we're good friends. One question over here. Yeah, because you're on Buddy Rich. Yeah, he actually was a judo instructor in the Marines. Yeah. Yeah, he was. I mean, that's, that's the truth, yeah. I mean, not only was he good at it, but he actually was an instructor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 yeah, he really was. Ed, what, what could you, you know, in, in our, our closing statements here, what could you say to these, to these musicians, these young players, these you know, dedicated, passionate people who see their future in front of them as far as the music industry, what could you give them as far as some advice, some encouragement as we close this down? Well, what I like to say to uh, my students, as well as other drummers that I meet, is that uh, no matter how high up on the ladder you go as a player, you don't have any more claim on the joy of playing than the guy who's doing the wedding or the bar mitzvah or any other little gig. We all share the same joy. We all have the same right to share the same joy of playing. So wherever your fate takes you or wherever your life takes you, enjoy and get the joy out of playing. Don't judge everything by where you are. Don't lose the joy of playing to the point of ever being so frustrated that maybe all your dreams haven't come true. Why don't you say to yourself, hey, I'm playing the drums. I don't care if it's one night a week or two nights a week, but I've still got a chance to play my drums that I love and play with other musicians that I love and go by that. 
because we all can't rise to the top. And there's not enough room for everybody to rise to the top. But I know some musicians that I've known, seriously, that play two nights a week, and they do something else as a main avocation or living. And they have such a ball on Friday and Saturday night, I can't tell you. They have a great time, and, and it makes their life rich. And that's what I'd like to leave with you, is that we all have the same claim on that. It, it doesn't relate to where you are on the ladder, OK? Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Ed Shaughnessy, our legend to give us incredible perspective. Ed, thank you so much, as always. As always.